Okay, Mervyn, can you just tell us your name and where we are and where um, you're from? Well, my name is Mervyn Carlos. Um, I'm a hop wirework contractor. Um, we're at Brookhouse Farm, which is Bromyard, just at Avonbury, just out of Bromyard. And they're just setting up a new hop industry. Um, it, it was a hop farm uh, 25 years ago, maybe. Uh, but all the war work was taken down uh, due to the fact that, uh, that they, they had problems with the wilt and the industry at that time was probably on the decline. Um, so that's it. Uh, it's a lovely spot. I mean, there used to be hops right through this valley, right through Bishop's Room on down to, to Dormington, uh, Mordiford, uh, with hops on almost every farm. And, and the Froome Valley is... Um, as good as the Team Valley, we like to think, as, as a hop growing area. Um, but I'm a contractor who works in the Team Valley, the Froome Valley, on probably 80% of the 80% of the farms that net still grow hops. I think I'm involved with either helping them in one way or another, either hop sampling or wire work, um, and that's. Uh, that's my story, I suppose. So for the lay person, tell us what that what wire working is and just tell us a little bit about the fact, about how you learned it and the fact that you're now sort of a bit of a dying breed. Just tell us a bit about Well, the, the wire work, as you see, a lot of people say to me, oh, you, you, you string the hops, which is, which is a classic. Um, but the stringing is one thing that I don't do. I build the framework, which is, which is here. As you see, um, most of the framework these days is something in the region of 16 feet high. All the work we do out of uh, tractors and loaders. Uh, in, in, the, in the olden days, they used to w use stilts or ladders or frames to get up. And obviously, back in the 40s, 50s, most hop wire work was evolved from canes and poles like runner beans. Uh, that's how hops were grown originally in the 1800s, I suppose, before the wire was uh, uh, was taken on. But of course, nowadays you see it's up. Um, we're talking here. Most of this is 16 feet high. Uh, the rows are eight feet apart, eight to nine feet apart. Sorry, I'm talking not metric, but <laughs> that's, uh, that's the way it's always been. Um, so that's basically it, and and. The wire work has evolved over the years. We've obviously now got dwarf hops, which are grown on uh, what they call low tro We don't call them dwarf hops because the Germans don't like it. I don't know whether we will put that in. Um, uh, they're, they're grown on low trellis, which involves a machine driving over top of the wire work. Um, it's a very complex machine, which which is, um, I mean, it, it's a it's a very good tool. Uh, but the yield per acre is, is not so good as the, the tall wire work. And the, at the moment, the varieties are, shall we say, the brewers still want a lot of the old traditional varieties, um, as well as the, obviously the new micro breweries is a breath of fresh air, because as everybody knows, I think it's on TV today that, uh, um, you know, it's on breakfast television this morning, I think. So at the moment, we're right in vogue a little bit better than wine. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we have sort of highs and lows um, in the hop industry. It's sort of, it's like the waves of the sea. We, we, we're in vogue for a while and then the world market, by what I can make of it, the world market sort of comes up uh, and there's too many and then it goes again. Um, and of course with the, I suppose the, onset of modernization and pelleting and you know they can keep things longer whereas going back 25 30 years ago hops were a green crop and because they were a green crop they the, the brewers bought so many pockets and at the end of the season they were no good basically so they they had to sort of throw away last year's and start with with this year's so that's basically what i do and where I'm coming from. So um, going right back then, tell us about your first sort of 
memories of hops and then just kind of a bit through how you got involved in hops and that kind of uh, what's your first memory well obviously my parents were were very involved in the in the hop picking and and obviously my father was uh, was a wire worker director long before me um and he sort of started when times were really quite hard because every every hole was dug by hand um they they use ladders or as I say stilts, and um, it was in the winter. It can be quite uh, quite daunting. You know, it is a muddy, mucky job. But uh, obviously now with modern modern equipment, we get on a lot better during the winter. Um, but my first memory is uh, at a farm uh, not very far from Newtown, which is where I was born. Um, I was hanging on the the, the when I, when I, when I actually grew up, hop picking machines were just coming in in the sixties. Um, so my memories are not quite as good as uh, my father's, but I, I heard a lot of tales about how many people were in Bishop's Room and and the surrounding areas. Uh, immense amount of people. Um, you've got the travelling fraternity. You've got people coming from South Wales, from Merthyr. You've got people coming from Birmingham, um, and they, they they sort of treated it as a working holiday. And it was incredible. I mean, there were so many people in the villages. Um, the pubs were full. And um, my, I'll tell you the tale about my, uh, my local public house uh, was about a quarter of a mile from home. And there they used to have a, a like a, a village hut. And because there were so many people, they'd fill a tin old tin bath full of full of beer and and everybody bring their own jam jar or jug or whatever. And the landlord, you, they used to scoop the beer out of the out of the tin bath and go and pay at the, at the trap hole. And, and they'd sit all around the crossroads at um, Newtown. And it must have been a sight to behold. And Bishop's room on a Sunday morning was uh, on a Saturday night, obviously was a bit hectic to say the least. I still don't drink in Bishop's Room because I've got this theory that you don't go there join off again. <laughs> but um, that's, that's another story. Um, so but tell us uh, about, um, about, you know, how people would have spent their downtime a bit. Then you talked about the kind of the um, Sunday trading horses. Oh, and yes, and yeah. Um, I mean, there was a lot of wheeling and dealing going on obviously they selling horses and uh they sort of as they say trot them up and down the the the, the village there at bishop's room um and that was going on in oh, maybe 20 30 villages all around the air tarrington all, all around um the Froom valley there there'd be i mean the the, the landlords used to sort of live for I mean, Christmas is supposed to be the busy time, but but with the with the with the hops, it, it was always September. Was I mean, it kept them for the rest of the winter. There were so many people, and oh, they they used to have a whale of a time. You know, it was uh, campfires, and uh, as I say, there are, there are so many families that are integrated now in into Herefordshire life that were either gypsy. Birmingham people or or Welsh people, uh, and and of course uh, even uh, I've I've picked ops with um, with people from Gloucester who, who would come out to uh, you know they were all as I say mo most of the men used to dump the women when they picked by hand and then come back on the weekend so they <laughs> you know it was a well a tremendous atmosphere uh, you know every every public house in 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 the county was 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 a buzz with um, with hop pickers, you know. On a Saturday night, uh, as you can imagine, in the winter, uh, the villages were were dead empty, and then all of a sudden, for one month of the year, there is an absolute uh, like a factory just starting up. You know, the the, the buzz was incredible. Uh, so do you, did you know of any kind of um, romances or? Oh or crikey! Affairs, <laughs> or affairs at oh, the heart, well, I you know no, about? I couldn't couldn't possibly say. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't possibly say about that. No, but romances, you know. Oh well, yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my I've got an auntie who married a Welshman. Uh, I've got another 
um, uncle who married um, uh, uh, somebody from Birmingham. You know, they they were all sort of interwoven. Yeah, oh, surely, yeah, there was a lot of that sort of romances going on. As you can imagine, when you work with people for a month or, you know, and sort of you get to know people and uh, you get this camaraderie or whatever, and there were obviously youngsters who wanted something to do, and, you know, they sort of had a, <laughs> had a good time, I, I suppose you say. Well, I suppose my, my first childhood memory would be uh, with my mother um, picking hops on a farm just just below where we live at Monksbury Court, um, where they used to pick in the old cribs. And I can just remember, well, as a child, you were you were supposed to help pick, but uh, us boys used to run about, run around and jump in the crib, and uh, it was all good fun. As I say, it was very very hectic. Um, I mean, there was men, women, children all over the place. You know, the women liked the fire at lunchtime and they'd all have their little separate fire and cook and yeah, marvellous sight, really. Um, and that, that was my first memory. And then when I was maybe five or six or seven, um, my father used to help with the hop drying at Monksbury Court. And um, I can remember going down there and hanging on uh, the bagger is is the machine that pockets the hops or bales the hops in these days uh, and they were sort of a manual press and of course the, the the man doing the bagging had to press on the handle and I used to swing on the on the back of the handle with my father and pretend I was the man <laughs> doing the bagging um, uh, and then as I say um, with my I was actually shipped off to uh, Birmingham on, so that my mother and father could work. Obviously, it was long hours. I was shipped off to some relations in Birmingham when I was in my sort of early teens, but I, because I was a bit of a nuisance then, obviously, and I was everywhere. And and obviously, with Opticon machine, I, as you see, with the, there's a lot of dangerous machinery where young children are not sort of allowed. So uh, I had a spell where I used to, that was my holiday. Uh, uh, my, my mother used to work obviously on the, the new machines. She'd be picking leaves out or spreading out um, uh, on the rollers, as they call it, spreading the hops as they went through. Um, and father was always either in the kiln or um, working in the, in the field. Um, I don't know if you know the new, um, uh, I was in Malvern the other day trying to buy some bits of tools and uh, the Morrison's at the bottom of Malvern Link, all of that was um, where the industrial estate is, was all hop. Uh, I felt quite old actually, I walked into the shop to buy these tools and uh, all these bought young, young um, well they were electricians I presume, buying cable and, and I explained to them that where they were stood was all hop fields that I sort of built 30 years previously, uh, which was a bit... <laughs> I don't really feel sad or glad, <laughs> but um, anyway, that's um, um, and then uh, I suppose my first job um, because father had a couple of small tractors. Um, that again, sent me out to a local farm to drive tractor. Well, not being a machinery man, I didn't spend too long driving the tractor. I ended up helping the men in the in the crow's nest, as you call it, or uh, in the in the loader, loading the and the trailer, loading the hops, which again was a marvelous time because they were all people from Birmingham, and I, uh, you know, they were all families, and uh, it was usually all one family, or sometimes you got two, and then you did get a bit of trouble. There was always conflict somewhere; everybody was working harder than the other person. So uh, I, I did about four five years in the field, four years in the field maybe. And then I sort of graduated to, I thought I'd better get an indoor indoor job. So uh, I helped the dryer then. Um, and I, I did the, as I call the bagging and the booking. I used to book out the pockets and um, shovel in. Well, I didn't shovel, I used to just drive the bagger basically. Um, and I did that for until I got married and then uh, after that, um, my father, he worked on a, as I say, this 
big farm at Malvern that did a thousand pockets and he used to pick ops he used to love it. He, he used to pick ops in three months of the year. He'd start in in August and end in October. Uh, and you know, I, uh, I I sort of graduated to working with him for a week in Malvern, uh, and then I'd do my four weeks in the kilns um, locally, uh, and then I'd go back the last week to help them out at Malvern when everybody was tired and uh, usual story. <laughs> The casual labour turned up for the first week, and then uh, they they wouldn't pay them then on the Saturday because if they pay the if if they pay them on the uh, sorry they wouldn't pay them on the Friday because they wouldn't work on the Saturday, so they'd all go and spend their money in the pub. So uh, they decided then they better pay them in on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> when I started obviously with my father with the wire work. Um, um, we we obviously got tractors that we. We, we sort of rented out uh, for, for hop hauling. Uh, and probably they're still the best tractors for hop hauling now. Uh, so that's that's how I sort of started with the picking. And, and obviously my father was, we, we, hop picking was all part of our, our year runs from hop picking to hop picking uh, as regard work. Uh, so um, the, the actual wire work you see, as soon as, as soon as ops are off, um, then the farmer can see if he's got any broken poles or wires broken or want any repairs done. Uh, and then you obviously the wire work has to be done between it with hops that are existing. Um, we've got to be sort of finished by March. So from September to March is is the major repairs as we call it. Um, uh, and that that is done through the winter. And we, as I say, we, we probably go to 80% of the farms and, and repair the war work or major repairs because they, they obviously got their own staff that can do the minor things. But when it comes to anchors and poles and major construction, um, I mean, that's they, they usually call us in. And uh, as I say, I sort of started with father and we, we sort of start from the ground up with new. Um, we put the pegs in to, to square out the field. Um, then we put the posts and the wire up uh, and we tie it all together because the wire work, as you can see, is all tied together, um, uh, which is, is, is quite time consuming. And then obviously the hooks, there has to be, a, every plant has two hooks. So in, in this field alone, that would be probably eight to 10,000 hooks uh, that have all got to be put on manually or with a compressor. Um, and it's, it's not, not quite as easy as, as I say, people think, oh, you, you, do, the, <laughs> you do the strings. Um, all the wire is, is, is as you see, is, um, is specifically made for the job. Um, and again, because of the decline uh, over recent years, we're having trouble getting the right material um, uh, I'm not sure where it all comes from now, but there were there were two firms that supplied uh, up in Sheffield, uh, and of course the farmer. Asked, luckily, we don't do anything with materials. Uh, I just supply the labour and, uh, and the know-how, uh, and the farmer buys the the equipment. I just go and say, well, we need this, this, and this, and our local supplier, he. Um, he supplies and I, I do the work. Well, so do you know where it does come from now, the wire then? Is it still from Sheffield? Well... Is that all gone now from Sheffield? Well, the most, most of the firms, as we know them, have, um, uh, and I say a lot of the small fittings, like the bolts and the links, um, these things here that maybe you'll see later on, um, the preformed dead ends, they come from um, Andover. Uh, and luckily, preformed products are very, very clever because before, before the onset of preforms, everything had to be wrapped by hand, a special pair of tongues to, to wrap it off. Whereas with the, the preformed products, they just wrap and they grip the wire, and um, you know they're a, was a boon to our our industry. Really, you didn't have to get on your knees and uh, wrapping the mud. Uh, 
and of course with the same same with putting in the anchor blocks every, every crossware has an anchor block that is in the ground at least four foot deep with a, a third of a sleeper or half a sleeper on the uh, on the bottom so again in my father's day he said he he used to dig 10 a day and fill them in whereas now we do probably 50 60 70 a day on on good going uh, which is you know so much easier now uh, and I I we um, spent many a day with a sledgehammer driving the bar through the ground um, to knock the bar through to meet the block unfortunately I suppose with the evolution of everything um, the industry has almost died a death in the last 20 years um, and because of that as I say most most of the people that work for me have either been just drawing the pension or been made redundant from um, from the most of them were op people who worked on hop farms who knew their way around um, when we did the uh, big job in the team valley I was lucky enough to take on two men who were foremen at hop farms and plus a, an op dryer who had been made redundant and they came to work for me um, and they knew the job uh, so my, my job was sort of fairly easy in the fact that I could uh, leave them to do quite a lot of the the inside work and 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 the people that that I've got now are unfortunately are a bit bit on the old side uh, but of course the the same same as everything um, when when the needs must you 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 find people to do the jobs as I say, the, the, the industry has gone now. There, there are still quite a few big hop farms, which are sort of factory units, uh, and they have to rely now on, on the foreign workers. Um, whereas, as I say, it was local, as in this country, um, Birmingham people uh, and West um, Wales, uh, and and obviously the the gypsy fraternity and um, that's the way that well most labour's gone in agriculture I think uh, whether it be potatoes grading daffodil bulbs you know that we we do have quite a lot of Eastern European um, uh, workers um, just just to prove a point on on the fact that uh, I'm probably still the last. Um, person who builds wire work in, in, in the country. Um, I had a, a chap who was a very good friend of mine now, uh, rang up from um, from Sussex. Um, I won't tell you his name because he gets embarrassed like me. We are born on the same day. Uh, I get on really well with him. Um, he rang up and he said, I see you've got your advert in the, the, the local, um, <clears throat> well, the calendar from the supplier. Uh, he said, I'd have had to go to Germany to get somebody with your experience. He said, can I come and come and see what you do? Um, consequently, he came up. We met in the pub. And I'm not one of these people to sort of, I took him round, uh, showed him all the work I'd done over the last sort of 20 years. We had a short tour. Uh, he said, you're just the man I need. So um, I ended up going all the way down to Sussex. Um, and I built um, probably a six or seven acre field for him um, and hopefully next year I'm going to do another one in the summer. So what's the future for wire work then? Um, well, <clears throat> I, think I, I think possibly if, if they can find the right variety, maybe the dwarf wire work will be the way. Um, because for uh, for several years I I sampled hops for uh, the groups that were fully into dwarfs, um, and they've as I say the 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 idea is right because there are so few people. It's it's all machinery, but um, um, unfortunately that's probably the way it'll go. Um, like the same as corn and hay and uh, years ago. Uh, thrashing corn was a was a social event 
um, and maybe it will go that there will be very few people working in hops. Uh, but at the moment, uh, the varieties that we've got um, seem to be on tall wire work, uh, and hopefully both hopefully both um, sides of hop growing will continue. Um, well, the, the, the basic structure is made up of anchors and poles. Um, every anchor bar in the ground has got um, a, a five foot bar with a, a third or a half a sleeper on. The corner anchors, we usually put three, three wires and a, a full sleeper. Um, obviously the corner pole is a X telegraph quite a big uh, a big piece of woodwork um, the wire we use is half inch roping which is seven ply uh, and on the ends in the modern era we've used um, uh, preformed line splices and preformed dead ends um, which are a, a boon to our industry um, the fittings at the top are all um, the the cross wires, as you can see, the the wires that go across, which explains itself. They they bear the 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 number six, which is the string wire that carries the hooks that the plants grow up. So obviously everything has to be strong enough, uh, and it's all seven ply. It has to be strong enough to withstand the wind in this time of year because obviously the hops are at their uh, ultimate at uh, ultimate weight um, and if if we get a thunderstorm like they've just had in Texas we could be in some sort of trouble um, I have known hop fields where floods have gone through at about five feet deep um, and knocked a few things down and um, we do get the odd unfortunately we do get the odd disaster because it's like a concertina effect with old wire work. If some wires break and the wind blows, it's a bit like a sail on a ship. And I've walked into fields where the outside's all stood up and the middle is flat, uh, which we don't try to get too often. Um, mostly it's due to the fact that most stop yards, because of the expense of, of building, um, they have been around a very long time. And they're usually the ones that um, that do, um, unfortunately, fall down. Um, but uh, keeping the structure square or as square as possible and everything tensioned equally uh, is quite important. Um, and yes, I mean, the ones that we built um, have been around a very long time now. Uh, when I started, there are still ones that I, my very first one, ones are still there which is which is nice you do have uh, to replace the wires even. um yeah um of course because with spray they don't they don't tend to damage the wire work like the old copper used to um everything the top wire used to go rusty within 20 years um nowadays uh, the wire work is still looks quite good uh, you know 20 30 years down the line um, we use um, a front end loader on a tractor where two men stand up in the box and tie all the wire together to make it a web. In the old days, um, obviously wire work was a lot lower, but um, they used to walk around on stilts, um, which my father never used to like because he got a bad knee and <laughs> uh, it didn't sort of go that way. Luckily, front end loaders and tractors had. Um, come in at that time even when he was uh, in his um, well mostly ladders I suppose my father they 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 use ladders and prop each other up uh, and run up and down but uh, nowhere near the height that, that these these fields are um, so um, that, that's about it with, with stilts so it's one of those things I never try there, there is a tale that um, one of the old um, um, Hop wire work men down in Kent used to, they used to throw his lunch up to him. He didn't come down. He stood there on leaning on the corner pole, uh, and uh, 
he'd eat his sandwiches stood up in the air to say he's getting down off these stilts once well, he was up, he was yeah up. once he was there that was it <laughs> So did the pickers used to walk on stilts? No, 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 no. It was always work. pulled. It was always pulled off the wire work, uh, and they used to have a chap walk behind the trailer called a pole puller. I think he's called in Herefordshire, um, and he had a long pole with a, a, a just a, a small sort of hook, and he would just knock, knock all the flags as we call them, which is a good name for it really. All the ops that were still hung up after they'd been pulled, um, he would. Um, he would knock them down, and then the women walking behind the trailer would throw all the all the flags in in the trailer, and then they'd go up to the picking machine and be picked again. And obviously, before that, in the days of the crib, uh, the men were there, and they'd knock them down and drop drop the bind into the into the crib, and the women would pick pick each bind and then throw it out, uh, which was a sight to see as well. You know. And then the bushler would come along with a basket, and he'd he would um, he would sort of bushel and if he liked you uh, you, you did not put too many in and <laughs> if he didn't he'd make you fill it right to the top but um, no it was um, again that was and then everybody was paid on the day you know the, the the foreman or manager would come out with the they'd all have tickets or books or whatever with the, the amount of ops they picked we started to tie this all together last last oh, Monday Monday morning um, and we drive up and down and I just put the toys on and use a yeah. special pair of tongues that are blacksmith made um, and we we tie it all together as I say to make a, a spider web of it and then obviously if you get a wire break then it will only go so far um, hopefully with new wire work it, it's a long long time this is part of a heritage project, so we're kind of like looking at the history of hops and things, mm. and also the future. I mean, why do you think it? Do you think it's an important thing to kind of recall these stories? Oh well, I think so. I mean, I mean, there are obviously, I think uh, Peter Davis at Claston, he he wrote a book uh, on his side of things, and and people have done various sort of books about uh, hops and hop growing. Um, yeah, it's it's one of those things where you, uh, I've got a, the interest, because we're getting a bit more in the, in the public eye now with hop growing, uh, with beer. Again, as I say, this um, real ale is now taken over from cider. Don't let Ellen Weston hear that because she's a friend of mine. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I'm beer. Beer is. In, in the right proportions is good for you um, and and w with with, the, with with these new microbreweries there are so many different tastes now um, you know what suits one doesn't suit another and uh, long may it continue you know the more varieties I suppose we we can put out in the marketplace and um, people take to them um, all well and good for for the industry hopefully we'll expand again and Half of the Froom Valley will be full of hops, but uh, we shall see. Oh, sorry. Can you just tell me that one thing about <coughs> you used to be able to look down the Froom Valley and all you could see was hop fields and caravans? Up, hops. Yeah, uh, uh, where I actually live at the top of Froom's Hill is a beautiful view down over the Froom Valley. And they tell me that in the day when, they were, when the hop pickers were picking by hand, it was just full of caravans, tents and hops. Uh, that's all you could see for you know several miles uh, unbelievable sight I suppose um, but of course that was just I can't quite remember that one <laughs> uh.